Hello and welcome to our latest webinar here at Movie Sense. So my name's Darren and I'll be going through elements of the 24-hour activity cycle model and its comprehensive and holistic approach to accurately determining activity over a 24-hour period. So in this webinar, we'll go through a short introduction of the 24-hour activity cycle model, then we'll delve deeper into the different components a little bit of an introduction as to who we are and what we do at MovieSense, how to go about assessing the different components of the 24-hour activity cycle using our products and services, and different solutions to some of the existing technical limitations and ideas for future research, and we'll finish off by a Q&A. So, introduction of the 24-hour activity cycle. So in 2019, March, in the Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercises, uh, there was a publication called the 24-Hour Activity Cycle, a new paradigm for physical activity. So the researchers, Rosenberger, Fulton, Buman, Troiano, Grandner, Buchner, and Haskell, came up with this different mod model of, of mapping the 24-hour activity cycle and defining the different activities that comprise of it. So we have four key components, obviously sleep, sedentary behavior, light physical activity, and moderate to phys vigorous physical activity. So the purpose was to create different guidelines to actually define these things, defining the health risks associated with them, discovering different interrelations and synergies, and then refining interventions. So in order to actualize this model, there are certain research requirements and different directions that need to take place in order to I guess, fulfill the potential of this different paradigm. So with measurement, distinguishing between sleep, light intensity activity and sedentary behavior using wearables, being able to actually do that clearly and concisely with high accuracy, improving the accuracy of activity measurement from wrist devices. So I know everyone wants to validate practically anything in order to use a Fitbit or whatever, but really actually understanding quality data and utilizing it in appropriate wearing positions to actually capture the information that we need. And then validating one device that's capable of measuring all the activities in the 24 hour activity cycle, which is, it, it has a lot of challenges. Then I guess going into epidemiology, so to do population level 24 hour measurements using these wearables, determining the best thresholds for optimal health, uh, developing recommended time for light intensity physical activity, which is still, it needs still clearer definition. And for disease prevention, prevent, you know, developing time-based guidelines for all of the different activities within the cycle. Then you're looking at interrelationships, so determining the optimal balance of the different components, so between sedentary and physical activity and also sleep. So does sleepiness increase time spent being sedentary and if you can then fix the sleep you can then reduce the sedentary time so then determining the optimal association between light intensity physical activity and health is this an association that's similar to that with moderate to vigorous physical activity or is there a different balance that's required so and then being able to actually optimize this model based on research as it comes out and obviously then we're looking at different specific populations of different key people. So to people in different disease states, diabetes, etc., pregnancy, women, children, the elderly. Also taking into account the individual social environmental determinants of 24 hour activity cycle compliance, like getting people to actually move their body a bit more and, and enabling that through a better design of an environment. You're evalu evaluating the relative and absolute intensities of optimizing them and optimizing the actual different elements of the cycle based on research as it comes out. And obviously behavioral interventions is a key component and that's on th something that we're really big on providing resources for to, to enable different interventions when it comes to activity. So individualizing the actual guidelines and determine how you can actually target a particular population, integrate that into different other elements in the environment, social factors and other behavioral determinants actually individualizing time spent in the 24 hour activity cycles in order to get synergistic effects on health. So optimizing 
one keystone habit potentially the one that's really down and then hopefully seeing an improved effect in the rest and then obviously the the long-term goal is to incorporate health measures to create a feedback loop for the 24-hour activity cycle so when you can find that one habit that can increase a person's moderate to vigorous physical activity or their light intensity physical activity making that happen and then hopefully seeing a lot of flow-on effects that then improve sleep, improve diet, improve overall health and well-being. So this is a conceptual model of fall prevention in adults, in older adults, obviously. Uh, you know, hopefully it's, we're not all in our you know, 20s and 30s and 40s falling over all over the place. Um, but this is based on the 24-hour activity cycle paradigm. So Activities of the paradigm within the dash box and possible mechanisms uh, are labeled. And pathway one here really represents the traditional framework that physiological effects of exercise modify for, like the risk factors. Like, So, for example, balance training improves balance, obviously, you, <laughs> you would hope. And modeling... And it's a very linear direction. So we're looking at things like walking and strength training and balance training hopefully then lead to a lower risk of falls. Whereas modeling it from the perspective and the paradigm of the 24 hour activity cycle creates possibilities of more pathways. So you can look at the interrelatedness of these things. So less sedentary behavior and more light activity in incorporated with or instead of these elements. And then hopefully that can lead to a lower risk of falls or even improved sleep, which then hopefully leads to less polypharmacy or sedentary use and then hopefully that then leads on to a lower risk of falls either of those particular models so and I think factoring in some of these broader contexts will give uh, it really multiplies the the effectiveness so I think no matter what your stance is on pharmacy or the pharma industry and don't worry, I definitely have a stance on it I think we can all agree that less pharmacological support uh, for the body, the better. The more the, the more lifestyle changes tend to be a lot more sustainable and carry less of a biological cost, whereas pharmacy obviously will carry its own costs and its own drawbacks. Now, I think the 24-hour activity cycle activities are, are relatively obvious to uh, pretty much anyone that's watching this webinar. Most of you guys are really in-depth in this field. So sleep and MET of you know, approximately 0.9, you know, sedentary behavior and MET of less than equal to 1.5. Then light physical activity is kind of usually the stickling point as to defining it clearly. Obviously, we go with a framework of 1.5 to 3, uh, less than equal to 3. And then vigorous and moderate to vigorous physical activity is anything over three and, and really vigorous is if you're getting up over six. So sleep is obviously characterized by reduced consciousness, perceptual disengagement and immobility. Moderate to vigorous physical activity is any voluntary movement produced by skeletal muscles that results in that particular range of energy expenditure. Now, sedentary behavior is characterized by both a sitting or lying posture and low levels of energy expenditure, but it's still slightly higher than sleeping. And then, yeah, light physical activity, there's no proper definition yet. So movement that is not described as sleep, sedentary behavior, or moderate to vigorous physical activity. So it's any light movement that results in a, a energy expenditure, like a, a rate over the basal metabolic rate. So the, uh, some sort of increase in actual physical movement. So we'll go into depth a little bit more on these components now. So sleep monitoring. So naturally recurring and easily reversible state that is characterized by con reduced consciousness, perceptual disengagement, immobility, and the adoption of a characteristic sleeping posture. Now, poor sleep, there's evidence for a high risk of weight gain, diabetes, hypertension, and depression. And amongst a whole host of things, it's really becoming more prominent in society now, the understanding that not getting a quality night's sleep really does have a lot of negative flow on effects for both your mental and physical well-being. So your health is affected by the total sleep time 
and the sleep quality. So when you're looking at sleep quality, it's understanding the sleep stages, the number of awakenings, the wake time after sleep onset, sleep latency, efficiency, and breathing. So it's regulated by a set of sleep-wake switches that are at least partially controlled by the neurotransmitter orexin. And it's comprised of two independent systems that originate in the midbrain and project throughout the brain and body. Sedentary behavior, which is you know, being labeled now as the new smoking for, for health outcomes. So independently of moderate to physical, vigorous physical activity, like there are a lot of negative things. But what we don't know yet is its relation with sleep behavior. Does better quality sleep predict less sedentary time or does poor quality sleep, you know, predict higher sedentary time? So studies show that time sitting increases the risk for all cause mortality. So I hope everyone, you know, got themselves a standing desk for at home office during the whole COVID pandemic and are working, uh, you know, happily sitting up at least and doing something that I hope puts us into that light to be, uh, light category of physical activity. So sedentary behavior, any walking, be uh, sorry, any, no, walking definitely doesn't comprise of this. Uh, so any waking behavior characterized by an energy expenditure of less than 1.5 MET, so metabolic, metabolic equivalent of tasks, while in a sitting, reclining, or lying posture. So I think sitting, I don't need to explain, uh, or passive sitting, reclining is obviously, you know, the deck chair time, and then lying you know, is all relatively self-explanatory. But the higher risk of early death, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and even cancers is reasonably well established now with sedentary behavior. Light to physical activity. This is, compared to sedentary behavior, there's a lower risk of early death, but not a lot is known about the effects and the relation with the volume of light to physical activity in the con in I guess the confines of the twenty four hour activity cycle, understanding if passive standing right so standing at the at the stand up desk for eight hours a day, how much of a positive benefit does that have, or does that just merely tire you out so that you can't do the vigorous activity later? So it's really any voluntary muscle movement that that falls underneath. A threshold of three in the METs. So, walking, uh, waking activity in a standing posture characterized by an e energy expenditure of greater than two while standing without ambulation. So, without walking, supported or, under, or unsupported is classified as active standing. And then we have the light intensity, which is when you're actually in motion, but you're not quite pushing yourself vigorously. So, Examples would be just, you know, housework, shopping, cooking, light gardening activities, something that's just moving your body through a range of motion as opposed to just standing rather statically. Moderate to vigorous physical activity, my arch nemesis. Um, sadly, there's a lot of evidence of lower risk of early death, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, bladder, breast, stomach cancer, 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 what am I talking about? Dementia even weight control. So moderate intensity is any voluntary movement produced by skeletal muscles that results in energy expenditure. On an absolute scale, physical activity is done at three to 5.9 times the intensity of rest. So that's three, three to 5.9 MET. Vigorous is when you're really pushing it. So on an absolute scale, it's six or more times the intensity of rest. Getting to know movie sense. And Yana needs to work on her posture. That, that can't be comfortable. So Movie Sense is a spin-off from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and it formed out of an interdisciplinary research group which was examining the relationship between stress, physical, and mental performance. And the research group found that the tools at the time for actually determining these things and answering questions about them were woefully inadequate. And so they went about developing their own tools and resources you know, several of which have now spun off into companies and MovieSense is one of those companies. So it was established in 2009, it's headquartered in Karlsruhe and we have 17 employees at the moment. Now, our big thing is providing solutions for multimodal ambulatory research. So on the left-hand side of this circle, uh, we're looking at things like the objective data. So 
capturing physical activity in an objective way through accelerometers and sensors, physiological sensors, examining the autonomic state. So looking at different things in the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So different sensors that can actually track the activation of those particular uh, components of the autonomic nervous system. Sleep, obviously, is becoming more and more critically important and having the tools and technology to be able to measure things in an ambulatory context really provides a, a an excellent insight into real world physical b behavior. So cognitive function as well. And then obviously data analysis is crucial. And then on the right hand side of this, we're actually looking at things like subjective data. So experience sampling, mobile sensing. So understanding the context of different people's behaviors, the geolocation. So you can drop in and see, okay, they weren't moving much this particular week. And then you can examine things like maybe the weather was particularly miserable during that time. And, and that, that can provide some, it's about providing a broader context and a broader understanding as to why each side of the uh, the circle, I guess, you know, if, if circles can have sides, how they interrelate with each other and how they influence each other. And interactive assessment is utilizing things like physical activity data, like a data from a sensor and changes in state or continued states to then trigger questions to actually understand the participant better. So to actually talk to your participants and say, okay, we can see now that you've been engaged in this particular activity for X number of minutes. Can you tell us why you're doing this? Uh, where are you? Are you with friends? Are you outdoors? Are you whatever? And building a clearer picture of what actually, what's influencing the, the actual participant, what elements comprise of potentially increasing activity or reducing sedentary time or improving sleep. So we're a worldwide company. We've got sales all around the place. It's growing more and more as we continue along. We've got a nice little batch of universities that have been using our technology for a while who we're, we're quite proud to work with and help out. Now, obviously, I don't really need to overly sell the concept of ambulatory assessment uh, to most of you. Most of you are doing work in ambulatory fields and understand the benefits of getting outside the lab. So. Obviously, the laboratory has its own effect on people and on participants, and there's a limit to how much time a participant can spend in a laboratory. And 24-hour cycle, like actually capturing that sort of data in a laboratory just does not reflect reality. So some of the great elements are real-time assessment. So you get a higher precision of subjective data. So when you're combining things with like experience sampling, you're actually getting a really precise insight at the actual moment that you're asking them. You're not trying to you know, survey them in a laboratory or any of those sort of elements where later on recall can have an influence on things. So assessment in everyday life. So it's, it's generalizable across different populations. So when you're actually examining a certain cohort, you can get a clearer understanding of how that particular cohort in that environment behaves. You can then repeat the assessments very easily and notice dynamic changes. And obviously something that we're really big on is multimodal assessment. So capturing the psychology, the physiology, the behavior, the context, and, and getting a really complete picture of the participant's activity, and then allowing that to inform your interpretation of the data. So interactive assessment is our favorite thing ever, which is utilizing queries based on physiology, behavior, and context. So being able to actually capture a particular moment and ask a very direct question based on physiology or changes in physiology, behavior, or context. So we strive to provide the optimal equipment to every researcher for conducting ambulatory assessment studies. So we're really for those who care about quality. Um, we There are some times when quantity does matter, but the reality is you're better off having 50 very high quality measurements instead of 500 mediocre ones. I think you can get a clearer interpretation and a more accurate interpretation of the data and, its, and how meaningful it is based on high quality data. 
So we develop systems for ambulatory assessment and experience sampling and mobile psychophysiological sensor systems. So we have a huge experience in not only developing the actual components, the biosignal processing, but also the algorithms and the data analysis side to actually assess things like physical activity. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail, detail later as to the quality of our assessment algorithms. But we also provide raw data, which is something that everyone seems to enjoy having just for, for long-term sustainability. So assessing physical behavior with MovieSense technology. So actually how we go about it and how we capture the data. The Move 4 is our core sensor. It's our, our base model. Every other sensor contains the functionality and the uh, signal acquisition of the Move 4. So <laughs> naming is kind of one of those things that, that can be very hard for people to understand the devices, but here it's really quite simple. So in the Move 4 is just everything to do with physical activity, movement of the body through space. So we have excellent activity recognition because we actually capture more different types of signals and we can utilize those signals in our assessments. So precise model-based energy expenditure determination. So we have things like a barometric air pressure sensor so we can understand what the participant is doing. Are they moving uphill, downhill, upstairs, downstairs? and factor that into our energy expenditure calculations. Raw data recording, so an open data format, and we can actually crunch live algorithms on board the sensor. So the sensor normally would connect to a cradle and then via USB it would upload all the data to your computer. You know, we're very big on data privacy and researcher integrity as well. So we, we, we want nothing to do with your data. There's no gateways, there's no uploading to our web platform and then you have to get it and pay us a subscription or anything like that. It's your research, it's your data. Utilizing that data as it's recorded, we can capture and do calculations on different physical activity metrics and then transmit that once per minute via Bluetooth to a smartphone, which can then couple to our experience sampling software. And that's how you can examine different physical characteristics and changes in them with the experience sampling software. So we can, I guess the, the sensor can record for approximately two months and you get roughly seven days out of the battery. So you can really set this loose and it can be worn continuously. It's water resistant. It can be worn continuously for seven days. And we've got all the usual stuff, the 3D accelerometer, the, gyro, uh, the 3D gyroscope, but the barometric altitude measurement and also temperature. These are elements that aren't utilized so much by other products in the market. So when we're looking at something like moving in, movement intensity, there's a filtering that happens and a calculation and averaging. There is a lot of processes that go into our analysis algorithm. So we don't just run a linear regression across a 24 hour cycle of data and say, here is our, here are our elements, you know, here is your data, here are your counts. We take each individual segment of activity, classify it, classify its intensity, classify the actual, uh, like the, the duration, and that's when we can then average out a very particular uh, say energy expenditure calculation and that gives us a, a really good and accurate assessment in in relation to a spirit ergometer we're really really close to the mark in some of these things so same with steps body position activity recognition and energy expenditure obviously but all of these different elements and components that it, it really matters that you're analyzing the data effectively. There's no point in having all this great quality data without actually having the means to analyze it. Now, when it comes to activity recognition, obviously there are things that are limited here. So it all depends on the wear position of the sensor. So if you're sitting or standing, you can't determine which one is which. So if it's worn on, say, the chest, or if it's worn on the wrist, you're your ability to determine a lot of body positions is really no more than, than arbitrary guesswork. 
This is why we definitely recommend either on the, the hip or on the thigh, especially if you want to capture things like sedentary behavior, the thigh is exceptional. However, hip, chest, wrist, it can be great for things like sleep detection as well. But all the other elements, it's a little bit more fallible. Here's some example data that we have, and I can show you now what I mean by the Spiro ergometer. So here is our Spiro uh, ergometer that's been worn, and that's our reference value. And then the purple sort of chunkier uh, analysis is the uh, MET calculation. So looking at our energy expenditure over that time. And we can see here, it's basically sitting not a lot happening. Pause, maybe they're, they're standing now because you can see a physical sort of a movement change has occurred. So, and then we go into normal walking and you can see relatively normal behavior, normal walking behavior, these sort of frequencies here. Then obviously something a lot more vigorous has occurred and we're tracking pretty closely on the whole. And on average, we work out very, very well versus the, the reference value. The only thing where you notice a strong deviation is in cycling detection because you just cannot know what gear they're cycling in, you know, what, what resistance the bike is actually providing them and what sort of level of exhaustion that it's, it's, it, you know, what work rate you're actually having to undergo during the cycling phase. But we do have excellent cycling detection now. And you can see climbing and going up and down bridges involves more effort and more energy in walking at certain different points, certain different elements. And we track really nicely along those peaks and troughs and it averages out quite beautifully. Now, cycling detection. This is actually a measurement that I did to determine it and it was actually on my thigh at the time. And we can see the things like the body position and the activity class. This is when I'm actually pumping the tires up because you know, I rarely get the bike out, bending down to undo the uh, undo the valve, pumping, you know, crouching again to do the valve, you know, pumping again, checking, you know, making sure everything's all good, and then I hop on and I go into my first cycling phase, which is activity class three here, and that's when I'm just cycling. I think I cycled for about four or five minutes just to go to the shops, and then I grab some things walking around in the store. So that's that activity class there. And then back on the bike, here's where I got stopped at a traffic light and was standing there for about two minutes roughly, I think it was, you know, because whenever you're in a rush, someone always finds a way to make sure you stop at a red light. And then I cycled on and that's me getting off the bike and walking into the office. So as long as you're using an appropriate sort of output interval, Cycling detection is really, really good. And you can see just the, the change in things like the, the angular rate, like the, the gyroscope here. And if you zoom into these elements, you can see that kind of circular pulsing motion because I'm, I'm not someone that just is constantly pedaling. I'll pedal for a bit, then coast, pedal, coast, pedal, coast, because uh, I, I just like to enjoy riding as opposed to racing to get somewhere. Now, assessing the 24-hour activity cycle components using our technology. Like, so what devices work where? What are the benefits? What are the drawbacks? What are the limitations? So our base device, the Move 4, really can cover most bases to a certain resolution of detail. So for things like sleep, Move 4 is fantastic. Sedentary behavior is exceptional. Light physical activity, also good. Moderate to vigorous, it also fits the bill. When you need to add more detail, so if you need to understand the desire to sleep, so turning off the lights or sleep onset, you might need something like the light move four. If you're studying sleep in shift workers, things, you know, people that do different sort of, you know, have different circadian rhythms to everyone else, the light move four will provide a huge insight into their exposure to daylight the time that they're exposed to daylight, their exposure to artificial lights, their desire to sleep. So actually switching off the lights and then you can compare that when they actually get to sleep versus the move. You know, uh, utilizing the accelerometer data, you can then see, okay, they have actually gotten to sleep roughly this time. They intended to go to sleep an hour ago, but they've been really restless and they couldn't. The ECG move four will give you ECG derived respiration and also, you can look at things like heart rate variability and see 
just how the heart is behaving and the parasympathetic nervous system is behaving and what level of recovery you're actually getting during that sleep phase. The move four is really great for sedentary behavior. We'll just go clockwise today. And one of the great elements you can, uh, one of the great things we can do is couple it with movie sense success. So not only do we then see the sedentary behavior, we can ask in real time why it's happening and maybe you know intervene into sedentary behavior and try and prompt new behaviors and new activities. So it's best worn on the thigh. It gives you excellent sitting detection on the thigh in this particular context, or on the hip is also quite good. On the wrist can be more problematic because you'll get different classifications of sedentary behavior, even when you're in the, say, an active standing position. If the wrist is stationary on the keyboard, but you're moving your body around uh, at a standing desk, for instance, that will often misclassify. Now, light physical activity, the move four, once again, shines, and either wearing it on the hip or the, the thigh, or even on the chest, you can get some very good measurements if you're moving your body through space so that you're actually on the way somewhere doing things. Vigorous activity, the move four has a very good overview here, especially worn on the hip or on the thigh, as I said. However, when you're doing things that are actually quite strenuous, say, lifting a weight, or riding on your peloton, apparently they're a big thing now, it won't detect these things because your physical mass isn't always moving through space and it doesn't recognize that you're doing, say, a bench press. You know, it might see that you're doing a dip, but it won't understand that you're actually supporting all of your body weight through your arms and or a squat. It will see that, but it doesn't know that you've got 80 kilos on your back as you bend down and push back up again, whereas the ECG will then provide some of those insights. You will see the elevated heart rate and then you understand that there's an element of exertion that's actually happening at the time. And with combining all these elements, that's when you can actually do the questionnaire. Say at the end of the increased heart rate period, you can then say, okay, 20 minutes after we've noticed an increased heart rate of, you know, for say 15 minutes we've noticed an increased heart rate at a certain threshold then we can ping them with a questionnaire and ask okay what what were you just doing and then they can say oh yeah i just did a workout or i went for you know i I was on my stationary bike or or something along those lines or a rowing machine or any of those things where you're not moving the body that much through physical space but you're getting a substantial heart rate increase and you're actually doing that moderate to vigorous physical activity which would normally be classified by most accelerometers in the light physical activity category. So obviously our recommendation for different elements on sleep, just overall detection, the move four is really good. Assessment of the intention to sleep, that's when you have to shift to the light move four. And then assessment of recovery at night, the ECG signal really, uh, really provides a, a, a gain, you know, a, a massive improvement of understanding and interpretation in that regard and then obviously subjective sleep analysis that questionnaire so a a on wake questionnaire or before going to bed questionnaire one of the great things about move this and success as a platform is it will work offline so the phone can be in flight mode it can be you know on the nightstand less of a distraction and for those who uh, you know are into kind of turning off most of the signals at night, which is I think one of the key recommendations for a lot of sleep uh, sleep research. So sleep detection, this is really good. This is actually a measurement from Yana, and this was when we had a when we had a a bit of a heat wave here in Germany and what I mean by heat wave is anything over 29 degrees Celsius is considered a heat wave here or, you know, I think it was 85 Fahrenheit, you know, in Germany, that's, that's a heat wave, which is for those of you from more harsher climates, that's, yeah, I'm chuckling along with you, but we can see here how restless the night was. A lot of periods of waking up, you can see the different bursts of activity, the, the, the tossing and turning because of the heat and the change in body position now, like you know, over a longer average, where all the flips back and forth are kind of recognised here in the accelerometer and the angular rate sensors. So, and then you can see here's a period of wakefulness, which you know, 
was a bit longer and one I think was getting a drink uh, she mentioned and then he is going to the toilet when you know getting up and then going back to bed that's probably hitting snooze on the alarm and then going back for a bit more of a sleep and then it's about the rest of her day so you can see the the change in the signals and the interpretation of them and when you have that questionnaire say here you can then get an even better determination. I had the advantage of obviously being able to talk to her after the measurement. And yeah, it was a restless night. It was a restless night for a lot of people. And you can really see that in the data. Had she worn an ECG as well, we'd be able to look in deep and see in comparison to other nights, how well she slept, how much recovery she actually experienced. Now, one of the areas where a lot of devices that are available like commercial devices and even some research devices is being able to determine the difference between non-wear and sleep and then sleep and wake states, which is just essential if you're really serious about estimating sleep duration based on accelerometer data. So there's a fantastic paper from Baruni et al. And you know, that's that you can see my name on there as well. And it's ambulatory sleep scoring using accelerometers. So distinguishing between non-wear and sleep-wake states. It's not the catchiest title. They didn't like my suggestions. But the, the chest-worn accelerometer was actually the best because we can utilize things based on the influence of the respiration wave on the power spectrum to determine things like non-wear and deep sleep. Otherwise, there's often confusion as to whether the device is actually being worn or not. And because uh, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, I'm not sure what a flowchart is worth. Um, so it's a picture plus word, so it's a thousand plus whatever we've got here. But this is how we've gone about the classification of the different three states. So non-wear, sleep and wake. So there's obviously a certain threshold that you need to pass before it starts being counted asleep and starts being counted as sedentary. And that's, I think, roughly 20 minutes is what we're utilizing because really we're looking at, when we're looking at broader contexts like sleep volume, it's something that's really, we're looking at the quality of the sleep. So the amount of times that, you're waking throughout the night or restless throughout the night and also the overall duration and a 20 minute sort of discrepancy here and there is not going to make the difference if you're getting four to five hours sleep if it was four hours 40 versus four hours 20 it's still a crappy and short night sleep versus a, you know an eight to nine hour night sleep which is apparently what we all should be getting and i really wish that that was the case now, measurement of sedentary behavior. So different wearing positions will give you different uh, solutions for different scenarios. So when your daily routine consists primarily of sitting, measuring the general activity level provides a useful measure of sedentary behavior. So the move or worn on the hip provides a convenient way to track the activity level and gives you a rough estimate of actual sedentary behavior time. Now, if you really want the distinction between sitting, lying, and standing, you can put the move four on the thigh. And then that allows you to distinguish between sitting and lying and standing, though like through using the different angles of the acceleration axis, our software, uh, the data analyzer software can differentiate between sit slash lie and stand. Now capturing sedentary behavior changes and the intensity of physical activity. So there's a strong desire from researchers to determine the level of activity intensity when transitioning in and out of sedentary periods. So to capture data on both the body position and energy expenditure and actually do that effectively, you really require two sensors. So a move four on the participant's thigh, which will then give you the distinction between sitting, lying versus standing, and a move for activity sensor on the upper body or hip, which will then give you the other distinction between standing or sitting versus lying to determine the energy expenditure. So you can use the combination of the two sensors and their body position to then make a, a, a clearer determination as to what their participants actually been doing. Now, an overview of the activity sensors and their validity. And I'm just gonna pause on this one. Yeah, and. This isn't to slag off the competition. I, you know, I meet these guys at conferences and they're all really nice people. And generally everyone in this field is actually really out to help the researcher as much as they can. However, the devices have their own inherent limitations. So when you're looking at 
sedentary behavior and the different body positions, so determining things between sitting and lying. If you're wearing it at the thigh, we're a pretty respectable 0.97, more than respectable. We're exceptional 0.97 and a very respectable 0.78, both of which are substantially better than the other key you know, sensors that are utilized commonly for these sorts of studies. And when it comes to classification of sedentary behavior, we have 0.95 when worn on the thigh versus ActiPal, which is 0.9. And some people say, what's the difference of 5%? Well, I hope people care enough that 5% improvement is 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 of value to you. And obviously, then we have the hip of 0.84 versus 0.69. And this is all in uh, Marco Giorgio's work in the Journal for the Measurement of Physical Behavior. Um, I thoroughly recommend... Uh, his work at the KET or Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, getting in touch with him or reading some of his papers on, on a lot. He's doing a lot of work with comparison of sensors, which there has been a lot of work on sensor comparisons that tend to exclude us because I think whether it's they are still unaware of our existence or they don't want to skew the data too much, I, I'm not sure. But Marco has been doing work with a lot of different sensors and... I think we're, we're comparing quite favorably. Now, activity monitoring to assess light intensity physical activity and moderate to vigorous physical activity. So different applications. So we've got things like measurements of steps, activity classes, movement intensity and or activity level and energy expenditure in everyday life. And generally our activity sensor, the MOVE4, is really, really good for that. You can even wear it on the wrist if you're not too concerned about things like body position and energy expenditure. Um, energy expenditure estimation for sitting or non-walking activities. So things when you're not moving your body in space, having a combination or having just the ECG move for and its insights into heart rate and the heart rate variability of a participant is going to give you a much better picture if they're doing the sorts of physical activity that isn't moving the body through space. GPS-based activity monitoring we can do through our experience sampling platform, Movies and Success. And obviously, bear in mind, GPS has its uh, has a limit of accuracy. It is you know you'll find people walking across the corners of buildings and things because of the way GPS works. It's not a limitation of our model, but it's just a limitation of the resolution of GPS. And I mean, let's face it, a, a, a ten meter or so approximation on the scale of the planet is relatively good. Um, and then obviously experience sampling is a great way of getting a subjective analysis of physical activity and utilizing the combination of the two technologies and actually capturing physical activity and then utilizing either changes or certain thresholds and ratios or certain values to trigger a questionnaire will then give you that joint recording of objective and subjective aspects of physical activity, like a complete picture of what's actually happening with your participant. Here's another one of my favorite little validation studies where we took an indirect calorimeter, which is you know, this charming device here that you have to wear, and we utilized also the actograph and the sensewear from Body Media, who were big at the time, and the first back in black version of the move to, so a couple of revisions ago. And there were certain activities that we wanted to assess whether we could improve the energy expenditure calculation utilizing a barometric air pressure sensor. So we looked at things like climbing upstairs, climbing downstairs, walking up a path with like a gradient and walking down the path. And this kind of speaks relatively for itself. I think it's pretty comprehensive as far as, yeah. If you, if you if it's a, if it's a sport you know we won um, so when you look at obviously the reference value is 100 percent all the time yeah you know, we're slightly above going upstairs slightly above going downstairs but when you look where the other competition is they are drastically down and you know quite substantially higher in their estimations walking uphill we're a little bit lower so Stairs, we're slightly higher, but walking up a gradient, we're slightly lower. And same, walking downhill, slightly lower. However, when compared to the competition, it's a substantial improvement in accuracy. And if you're doing things like interventions, you want to know if they're working. You want to see what effect you're having 
on participants' behavior and what their actual behavior is to begin with. And so using a quality device that can actually determine these things with a higher accuracy gives your publication more weight. Now, limitations. The sensor measures the acceleration at the place of the sensor itself. So getting a decent analysis, it's just essential to choose an excellent wear position. So the wrist, as you know, happily modeled here, isn't actually the ideal position for a lot of uh, the analysis of the 24 hour activity cycle. So, but depending on the different sensor position, different kinds of movement and body position analyses become possible. So unfortunately we can't determine the information about the location of a person with accelerometry. And I don't think any devices out there at the moment are doing uh, incorporation with things like GPS and stuff. Just be, the battery usage on these sorts of things is quite intense. Um, and there's a limited number of activity classes, but this is where it's essential that you can utilize different technologies in order to overcome this limitation. And obviously we have our experience sampling platform, which is the right hand side of the circle that I discussed earlier. It's utilizing the participants and getting feedback from them to get to get a greater insight and understand the context of the data that you're capturing on the sensor. So our our platform is 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 Android based. Um, this is of a sort of an ethical decision which I can go into in more detail, but it is not available on Apple. There's a really flexible sampling strategies and a wide choice of item formats. You can collect a lot of qualitative and quantitative data this way. Actual mobile sensing, so you don't, you're sensing the person's interaction with the phone and actually understanding their interaction with the phone as well and combining that with their activity cycle is I think something that's really going to be a prominent direction of future research, like how much people are utilizing their phones and, and how much it's affecting their physical activity and, and sleep and sedentary and so on. And we're really lucky in the fact that we can couple with all of the different sensors. So we, we can trigger a questionnaire. So we, we use our research grade sensors. The data is captured on the sensor. However, we can actually then utilize certain calculations that happen. So movement acceleration being one step count, MET, MET level, so sedentary, light, moderate, vigorous. All of those can be captured just by the move four and transmitted on a minute by minute basis. So it's capturing the data and it looks at the minutes data it's collected, runs a calculation on it and sends these values via Bluetooth low energy. And then you can actually ask your participant questions based on what's happening. Obviously, if you have one of the other sensors, you can include things like light, so different light elements that it's actually experiencing, or ECG, you can look at the heart rate, the RMSSD, so the high frequency heart rate variability, and then EDA even, if you're wanting to look at things like sympathetic nervous system activation, you know, you can get better context on that. Are they experiencing a massive spike because they have just had, you know, won the lottery and got a phone call about it, or they've just walked into a store and saw the love of their life, or are they under threat? You know, you can help distinguish between challenge and threat and all these different elements by then asking a questionnaire and actually finding out further information. Now, we have our rather creatively named data merger. So we have, you know, things like the sensor manager, we have the data analyzer, now we have the data merger, which allows you to merge the objective and subjective data and get something that then is easier to analyze further in things like SPSS or, or whatever stats sort of parcel you know, package that your, your nerd of choice is, is utilizing for you. And it, it supports all the different study design structures and it just allows a better synchronization which gives you a better insight long-term. So I think I've covered most of the elements that we wanted to discuss. And now I would really ask you to throw as many questions as you can into the group chat and we will do our absolute best to answer them. We'll go back live. So we'll be sitting there in the office waiting happily for you to, to fire us a question. And we're really hopeful that you'll take this opportunity. And I know there are some really prominent 
people here as well and I'm, I'd really love their feedback and their insights and to bounce off of them that would be great and apart from that thank you all for attending and we'll now cross back live to the studio